Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 28th of May. I'm Robert Bowick, and I'm joined today by Citizens Party's Victoria State Chairman, Jeremy Beck. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, huge win. Senate inquiry slams Morrison and Australia Post. And bring back affordable insurance. So first, huge win. Senate inquiry slams the government and Australia Post. And Jeremy, it is a huge win. We have um, worked very hard for the last, what is it, six months roughly, since October, maybe seven, um, on this Australia Post campaign. And we now have a report from the inquiry that we forced the parliament to conduct mm -hmm. that is explosive. An excellent report. Uh, the, the recommendations are pretty much everything you could wish for. It is. Absolutely <laughs> it is. So, and, you know, we'll comment on this a bit more, but people should, um, don't be married to defeat, right? Uh, everything you fight for doesn't necessarily work out the way you, you would hope it or plan, etc. But you can expect success um, if you work hard enough and focus on something as much as we've done on this issue. Um, what we have here is, uh, we put it out, we did a press release on this yesterday, and the headline is Apologise, Resign, Scathing Senate Report, a huge win for Christine Holgate, Australia Post campaign. Um, we did a, the campaign we ran that, you know, brought, was entirely uh, grassroots, it was outside of the, the political, the, main, the mainstream political parties, right, and, and, and even the minor ones. It was outside of the media coverage. The media wasn't interested. But we picked up this issue. We saw that there was something completely dodgy in the way the Prime Minister had carried on about Christine Holgate. Um, because in our view, correctly, he had no credibility. Right. So when he was carrying on like that, we knew there was something wrong. We learned the uh, licensed post officer's side of the story. And that's key here. Because what it was them, it was the 3,000 licensed post officers who paid tribute to Christine Holgate as the best CEO Australia Post ever had. The question was why? And when they told us why, it was mind blowing, mm -hmm. right? The real story was the opposite of, the, like the watches themselves represented the opposite of what they'd been presented, <laughs> right? Imagine how perverse that was. Everybody said, oh, fat cat executives shouldn't splurge money on watches. And that's how it was, how it was delivered. Instead, those watches had been a reward for a deal that had, that had served Australians. Right, served the public, especially out in, in um, regional areas. And in our latest uh, New Citizen here, the, the, the front page, you can zoom in on the map, Australia Post campaign transformed the nation. There's a new online um, news service called The Regional where the, the reporter, Dale Webster, has done some excellent work looking at the shutdown of bank branches across regional Australia. And it's been huge. They've basically halved since 1975 even though the population would have increased in that time. And those circles with the colours show you the areas, how many branches have shut in those areas. Um, in many of those cases, places only Australia Post exists for people to conduct banking services mm -hmm. through, right? Uh, Christine Holgate saved all that. She served the Australian people, yet it was twisted and perverse and she was drummed out of Parliament. So we turned that around, we forced, we forced an inquiry, we have got to pay tribute to Bob Catter, he was the first MP to not even care um, uh, about the appearance of this. He just knew the treatment of Christine Holgate was wrong and he stepped up to defend her. Barnaby Joyce was the first to speak up for the Nationals. Uh, Pauline Hanson deserves a lot of credit because when she got involved, boy, did she turn it on its head. And she, um, it was her efforts that, that led to this Senate inquiry. The inquiry itself was exceptional, apart from... The two spoilers in there, <laughs> Senator Henderson and Senator Kitching, who at a certain point we may never have to refer to again, apart from those two, the, the, it was very serious inquiry, right? They, 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 um, uh, you had Labor, Kim Carr, you had Bridget McKenzie from the Nationals, you had Sarah Hanson-Young who chaired it, and you had Pauline Hanson, and they were very serious about getting to the nub of the matter. And they have, so, and I knew that that part was going well. And then the, the final question was, what sort of report will they produce? Because you know, behind the scenes, there's all kinds of pressures, etc. And I was bracing myself for this will be a fluffy report. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely not. It's devastating. It's scathing, and it's 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 everything you can hope for. Short of reinstating um, Christine, which is the government's prerogative, and they mm -hmm. were never going to do that. 
Um, so short of that, this is, this is everything that you can hope for. Let me read you some of the, the comments in the um, report, which, are, which are, give you the, the scathing tone. So the executive summary slams Scott Morrison personally. It, sa it says the evidence before this committee indicates that the ultimatum that the chief executive has been instructed to stand aside and if she doesn't wish to do that, she can go, was not a spur of the moment reaction, but rather a calculated response aimed at achieving a predetermined outcome. And that goes to the heart of, we were, we were questioning that, you know, forget this rubbish about, oh, Scott Morrison was under pressure that day, et cetera, and he lost, no, no, no. This was, this, this was definitely part of, a, 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 of an agenda to get Christine Holger out of the way, right? So it, it, it um, backs that up. It de the report declares, quote, it is undeniable that the board and the government, including the shareholder, Minister and the Prime Minister abandoned Ms Holgate to suffer immeasurably and ultimately to tender her resignation only 10 days later. It criticises Scott Morrison personally for, quote, a lack of respect for due process and procedural fairness. It pinpoints, quote, a culture operating outside the legislative framework that results in so-called independent government agencies being controlled by ministers and their advisers through informal directions in a completely unaccountable manner. And this starts getting to the heart of where Australia Post needs to go in the future. It notes that, quote, political pressure appears to have led the board to breach its duties under the Act, standing Ms Holgate aside without any evidence that she had acted in properly. Um, well, I think there's some very important recommendations there, including some significant legal consequences, really. Uh, this potentially could go in places which some people are really going to find very awkward to get their way out of it. The legal, the, you're, no, you're right. The legal mm. consequences part is, is, the, is mm. the unresolved part of this mm. report. Now, in the, in the next segment, we're gonna, we'll, go, we'll spend the next segment going through the recommendations. Just before we do, though, I just wanted, there's a, what I was reading out then was from the executive summary. I want to read you some of the quotes from the second chapter, which is talking about what goes to the question of the, the, the inquiry, essentially accusing Australia Post of a cover-up. And this is big. Right, this is very significant that they're saying you guys did not treat this inquiry seriously. I'll just read you some of those quotes. They said, um, the committee nevertheless has significant concerns about Australia Post's engagement with this inquiry, each of which will be discussed in turn. And these are the issues. Respect for the Senate's authority and processes, potential interference with individuals, including Australia Post employees and contractors, wishing to make submissions or give evidence to this inquiry, and allegations of false or misleading evidence provided by the Chair of Australia Post, Mr. Lucio Di Bartolomeo, to this inquiry and to the committee at Senate Estimates. Um, they, they pinpoint that one of the things they did was the, was the announcement of a new CEO the day before the inquiry started, the first hearing started, sorry. Mm. They said this was rushed out to deliberately disrespect the committee's inquiry and without regard to the impact such an announcement would likely have on the committee's key witnesses. Um, then it talks about the fact that Australia Post was not forthcoming with information that the committee was asking for and using all these uh, uh, excuses. Um, the, 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 it, it said, the Senate and Senate committees take any obstruction or interference with its processes extremely seriously. These matters may be treated by the Senate as contempt. And then it says, this is, what's, this is what you're referring to a second ago, mm -hmm. This, the, this is what it leaves hanging over the chair, Lucio Di Bartolomeo's head. The committee notes with concern the apparent inconsistencies and discrepancies with the evidence provided by the chair of Australia Post, Mr Di Bartolomeo. The committee has decided to examine these matters thoroughly and will decide when and how to report its findings on this issue to the Senate after detailed examination and deliberation. In other words, we're not finished with you yet, buddy. Mm -hmm. Stand by, we're looking at this more. And what there's a process in Parliament called the Privileges Committee, and they're the people that examine whether someone has misled Parliament, had, had been in, is in contempt of Parliament, etc. And that is what's hanging over the Australia Post chair and board, and potentially the government, as a result of this inquiry. Right, so this, this is huge. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll go through the recommendations that Jeremy was talking about. Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're talking about huge win. Senate inquiry slams Morrison and Australia Post. 
So Jeremy, let's go through the recommendations. There's 25 recommendations from this inquiry. We're not going to go through all 25, but I've, I've pulled out um, 10 or so of the best ones, and they're the most consequential. Some are some are more technical, um, and we'll we'll give you we'll describe what it is and then elaborate a bit. So recommendation number four is for an Auditor General investigation of the legality of Communications Minister Paul Fletcher's instruction that the Chair Standis Christine Holgate aside. And this, earlier I referenced this thing where they talked about the informal arrangements between the Ministers and these government business enterprises. This, this goes to the heart of that. When the Prime Minister said she can go and the, the, the Minister said to the Chair, Christine Holgate needs to stand aside, it's like it's well and good to say that. He had no authority to say that, and the chair had no authority to implement that, which is why actually the chair lied and said she'd agreed to, because he actually couldn't force her, right? And she didn't agree to. But this this is a this is a big deal. And what it, and what came out of the inquiry is this is actually a common practice. These ministers are casually and informally saying to these government business enterprises that are supposed to be independent, do this, do this, do this. Right, and they're breaking their own rules. And so this is gonna be a big issue for Paul Fletcher, the communications minister going forward, and it should be because his behavior has been appalling. Um, recommendation number five, the prime minister, shareholder ministers and board apologize to Christine Holgate. And you know, we're living in a civil society, it's exactly what they should do. Recommendation number six, the solicitor general investigate the legality of the instruction to stand Christine Holgate aside what I said earlier, but this time the Solicitor General. Um, recommendation number seven, restore the independence of the board. And this has to be a no-brainer, right? If you, the, the, there were so many Liberal Party hacks on this board of Australia Post, they've made a joke of the organisation, right? And, what, and, and don't think we're singling out the Liberal Party here. One of the things I discovered in this process is that the two major parties regard the boards of these government business enterprises as spoils of war, right? They win government, clear out the other, top, the other side's directors, we'll put our own in. Well, that's happened before with Australia Post. You had you know, Labor, Labor Party political hacks in there, and yeah. now it's Liberal Party yeah, it's political, Liberal political hacks. hacks. No, it's, it's, got to, it's got to go, mm. right? And then that, that goes to the next recommendation as well. Restructure the board to include nominees from the House of Reps, Nominees from the Senate, nominees from the employees, and nominees from the licensed post offices. And that would be a very good thing if the board is restructured that way. Recommendation number 13, the chair should resign to accept responsibility for the organisation's failings with respect to the Holgate matter. And that, if that happens, that would be a great outcome because right now nobody has any confidence in this chair based on, on his actions. It's not just that he was on the side of the government, therefore you, it's hard to single him out from the government. His responsibility was to the good management of Australia Post and to his CEO, who he acknowledges was the best, was an excellent manager, and he threw her under a bus, right? For the sake of our asset, Australia Post, Terry McCran talked about this in the, in the Australian newspaper. For the sake of our asset, Australia Post, we should all be demanding he go, right? Um, uh, recommendation number 14. This is very interesting. All banks should be required to allow Australia Post to serve their customers and pay for the cost of that service as part of their banking licence. And what this means is at the moment, um, three of the four bank, big banks did a deal with Australia Post for this Bank at Post thing. They did the, they're the ones that did the deal with Christine Holgate in 2018. ANZ didn't. Um, ANZ customers can't bank at post offices now. Well, that's why this is such an important recommendation that it means that ANZ could not you know, get out or any other bank, they would do that for the common good of the community. You yeah. can't have a town out there with no banking services with one of the major banks. You know, these are big four banks. They have some responsibility or should, or it should be legislated. No, exactly. So uh, there's this, this is saying make it a requirement of the banking licence. If you have a banking licence, mm. you have to let Australia Post serve your customers and you have to pay the cost of them doing that, mm. right? That'll also mean that the deal that has been so consequential for the licensed post offices that made them viable, but now it's coming due to expire, and if the banks don't renew, they'll be back to where they started. That won't happen. It'll mean the, ba the, the banks will always ha have to renew the deal, and, and the um, Australia Post can stay viable. Um, 
Recommendation uh, 17, the government expressly rule out privatising Australia Post in whole or in part. And, and I'll just end on that one because, look, that is, Jeremy, the, of all the things we've achieved with this campaign, that is the most definitive victory. Not only have they said expressly rule it out, the government's already done that, mm. right? Now, this is a government that, yeah, yeah, you can't trust them and all that. That's all true. But you've got to read, the, you've got to read the, the terrain here. They are heading for the hills. They're not game to touch this now that it's blown up in their face. It would be just so politically toxic for them to go around now and privatise Australia Post. It just won't happen yeah. in, in this term of, of office. Sure, yeah, we have to be on our game. We can't be complacent. Uh, next government could easily go for a privatisation. But this is a huge victory right now. I would say, it, I would say they wouldn't be game to touch it for a few terms. Yeah. That said... We have good sources, and mm. I can tell you those sources are very well placed, and they have confirmed, despite all the denials, mm. that this was ever a factor. The gov they, they have confirmed it absolutely was what the government was pushing for. And now we have, that, we have made it blow up in their face. That's the most definitive accomplishment of this campaign. We didn't, we didn't go into this anticipating that would be the outcome, mm. but we have achieved that outcome, right? So, and that credit for that goes to the public who watched this show Watch the other shows, subscribe to the Australian Alert Service, but more importantly, participate in the campaigns. The calls you make, the emails you send, the flyers you distribute, they're all incredibly important in getting us to this point, right? This is how we change public opinion um, on this issue. And now, where do we go from here? I mean, there will be, we'll keep an eye on the ongoing things that have to be yet to be resolved. This here I'm holding up is the explanatory memorandum of the bill that we're putting up to Parliament, the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank Bill 2021, right? We will provide a flyer version of this that people can share, share around so that it explains how it would work. This is where we're going next. Now's the time to actually get this bill introduced into Parliament, get it debated and get it voted on, right? Because this is something that can act... One of the, everyone in this campaign, in all the politi political parties, paid lip service to so this is a good idea. Let's actually achieve it. Right, so you'll see our, our um, uh, efforts focused on that um, uh, as we go forward. All right, let's take a break because when we come back, we're going to talk about another aspect of a national banking system, which is not banking, it's insurance. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, Bring back affordable government insurance. Now, this is a, an interesting subject, Jeremy, and um, we're going to be reminding people, hopefully, of how things used to be. Um, we decided to do it because in the budget, there was this little item that I described from the Morrison government, Morrison and Frydenberg, as a good-ish <laughs> <laughs> policy to... Um, uh, set up a $10 billion reinsurance pool. The government will contribute to a $10 billion reinsurance pool for Northern Australia. Now, I call mm. it good-ish. What do you yeah, think of that? that? That's a bit generous, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> but look, the, the government claims that this will save, over 10 years, $1.5 billion in insurance premiums for yeah. Northern Australians for specifically cyclone damage and the flood-related damage from cyclones. Now, we've yet to see whether that will eventuate, uh, maybe it will just be a, a, a big business bailout, an insurance company bailout. Yeah, that's what I, you got to look out for. I, I think that's the concern we have. However, the reason I added the well, the reason I put good before the ish, <laughs> the, my, the ish was my qualification, is that this is a step for the of the towards the government being more involved in insurance, which the government used to be. That's right. Now, before we do that, though, I just. I, let Jeremy talk about one of his pet subjects. That, that because this is for Northern Australia, it's relating to, like you said, cyclone and all those natural disaster damages. Um, and th in those areas, insurance premiums are skyrocketing. But let's put one thing to bed. It's not because of climate change, is it? Definitely not. Uh, the official Bureau of Meteorology data for cyclones for intensity and frequency show no clear trends. In fact, it appears, if anything, uh, the cyclones are not as bad as they were decades ago, but that's up for debate. But there's certainly no clear trends that yeah. there's some you know, major problem. Uh, and this is true worldwide. If you look at hurricanes or wild weather, 
there are numerous different official government agencies around the world that measure these things and say, oh, look, it's not true. That they're not increasing in frequency or intensity. And that's just the big insurance company beat up to try and justify their enormous premiums. So what's the other likely explanation for, in premium, for premiums in these areas skyrocketing is mm. this. For close to a century, Australian governments used to be involved in insurance. They had government insurance offices um, that operated, like I said, for close to a century, but they were privatised starting in the 1990s. And since they were privatised and government has not been involved in providing insurance um, cheaply, mm. insurance premiums are skyrocketing. Because that's what happens when the private sector gets a monopoly on something, they just extract as much profit as they can. So tell us about this article you've just written about uh, SGIO in Queensland. The State Government Insurance Office was commenced with legislation in 1916. It formally started in 1917. John Arthur Fahirli was the key instrumental politician, he's a Labor Party politician, who steered this legislation through the, the, the Queensland Parliament. And it ensured that there was fair insurance. And if any extra money was pulled into this insurance uh, company, the government-owned insurance company, if if for whatever reason they weren't having to pay out you know, payouts yeah. uh, and, it, and the money piled up and piled up, uh, they'd end up giving it back and, and uh, they'd say, well, you don't have to pay your premium this year because yeah. you've already paid into it collectively. Yeah. Uh, and that was for the common good. So, it, it, look, I, I'll read out this amazing quote I found in one of the uh, newspapers here. This is a 2nd of August 1917 statement uh, that John Arthur Fairley said, was somewhat of an experience to increase the benefit by approximately 75% without charging the employer a higher rate. The government is well pleased with the position and premium payers will no doubt have undergone the novel experience of being told, firstly, that greatly increased benefits under the Workers' Compensation Act would not cost them a penny extra. And secondly, that not only would it cost nothing more, but that £18,500 too much had been paid. This advertisement for state insurance is a splendid one, and I fancy it is the first instance in the history of accident insurance where the benefits have been amplified and the premiums at the same time cut down. Uh, now, that, that is incredible. A private insurance company would just pocket the profits. Yeah, yeah of course. That, that, that's exactly what that would be. Um, this institution that exists to make sure that, hey, go, let's have a system where we're all covered, mm. right? And that's the purpose. That's what it can do, with, backed up by the wealth of the government. We, we can put this little graphic there um, that we run here, which is from the, the Daily Standard on the 16th of March, 1920, where three years after your quote, um, he's announcing another premium um, mm -hmm. holiday because, that's right. because the, uh, they had plenty of money in the pool. Yeah, exactly right. It was a, basically, you, you get... Uh, Two, two years insurance for the price of one year's premium. <laughs> <laughs> and look, that's, this is what we need to go back to. We need a financial system that serves everybody. We propose a national banking system with different aspects like a postal bank, a development bank. But you also need insurance that can make sure people get insured because we, it's a productive part of the economy out there. But Jeremy, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more.